now. Maybe I can use those couple of minutes to give a quick update on the boot camp here in Porto. Um, everyone's pretty busy building. Um, Seth just stepped out uh, for something extremely important because he got sandwiches for everyone. Um, so that we're going to be, no one's going to go hungry during uh, the lecture and everyone's going to be here and focused. Good to see that we have this many people join. I think we're pretty stable now at 71 attendees. Um, as with every lecture, this one, of course, will also be recorded and available for later for those that cannot watch it live due to the time zone or because they're busy building right now. And I think that's it. Let me just quickly check with uh, Isaac and Seb if we're ready to roll. Are we good to go? Yeah. Okay. All right. Then I would say over to you, Austin. Thanks so much for being part of this and uh, sharing your experience. And I will turn my mic and camera off and tune in. All right. Um, okay. I'm going to go ahead and start the video. I was told to make a 30 minute video. It ended up being 45 minutes. So um, ping me in the Q&A if something just is way off. I'm happy to stick around a little bit afterwards and do a full QA session. Uh, so just endure my long windedness uh, initially and um, send your questions to the window. Hello, I'm Austin Fothery. Uh, I'm happy to be with you today to walk through some of the basics of Matoko. And uh, I just wanted to say hello and welcome to the class. I hope that um, you're learning a lot and I hope this will be helpful. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Okay, so today we're looking at optional types, switch and cases, uh, the options module and lists, and we're just gonna jump right into it. Today, I hope that by the end of this lecture, um, you know how to use optional types and null variables and things that uh, have to do with options and nulls that you are a master of the switch statement. And this is actually a really hard thing to, to master. And for me, the switch statement was the biggest wall that I had to pound in my head against to understand Matoko and to start working with Matoko uh, efficiently. I wanted them to be select cases and they're not, they're switch statements. And hopefully we'll, we'll make that more clear to you. And then uh, we're also gonna look at how to create the right list for the right job. There are lots of list objects on the internet computer and on and in Matoko. And I want you to make sure that you know uh, how to pick the right one from the beginning so that you don't uh, shoot yourself in the foot and cause problems for yourself later. Just yesterday, I saw uh, some production code where I looked through it and they were using a library that was not, not necessarily something they should be using. And you want to give your users confidence in your contract and it's going to be scalable and, and all of those things. So again, my name is Austin Fothery, AFAT on Twitter. Uh, you can see my GitHub there. I am CTO at Origin Foundation and I am also the executive director at icdevs.org. Um, Origin is a foundation that seeks to create a digital certification network for both physical and digital goods uh, and build marketplaces and services and, and all kinds of things around that network uh, to in a way that protects human ingenuity and uh, creates value for people up and down the, the indus different industries that we will be working with. And IC devs will hopefully be an important thing for you after this boot camp because uh, we have a lot of bounties and we have a lot of work that needs to be done by the community. We're a 501c3. Uh, we help, we're here to support Matoko developers, Rust developers, internet computer DAP developers. We work closely with the foundation to create bounties and to create opportunities for IC developers. I've been thinking about uh, how to use the internet computer for a long time. As far as assumptions go, I'm not gonna try to make too many assumptions. I do assume you have some basic programming knowledge. Um, you sort of understand what an if then or a select case, switch case statement is. You know, the basics of array programming and what makes up an array. 
uh, and that you understand the concept of null in, in, in computing. Um, and if you don't, then maybe go look those up real fast and then come back and, um, and pick this up. There are links to follow along. Each of these links will load up a instance of Motoko Playground where you can edit this code yourself and change things up and try things out and hopefully it'll give you a good, a good springboard to learn these concepts. First, we're going to start with optional types. Well, what does optional type mean? Well, that, that means null. Uh, the first thing to know about optional types is to avoid them. This, is, this line is from the Motoko Definity guideline and it basically says, you know, try to use them as sparingly as possible. Sometimes you can't get away from it. Uh, why don't you want to use optionals and nulls? Well, they start to make your code messy. And we will see that in just a second. Um, there is also an option-based library. Just as a heads up, I do not use that very often. The reason I don't use it very often is that typically it is easier to use switch statements or do statements to, uh, to unwind those. Let's take a quick look at some code so you know what the heck I was just talking about. Each of these Motoko playgrounds will, will have a, a, a set of code. You can deploy it and you can run the function. So our first function is a say function and uh, it's just here as an example, right? So the, the, the phrase comes in and we're just gonna say back the phrase. So this is, this is, this is pretty easy. We're in a query, uh, nothing and it brings back nothing. If we query test, it, it brings back test. If you wanna start getting fancy, uh, you could create functions that take what we call an optional type. And to create an optional type, super easy, you put a question mark in front of a type. Here, we're taking an optional text. So if you pass in uh, a text, we're going to say it. Uh, we're going we're gonna to have to unwrap it. So uh, this one's a little more complicated, right? So if, if the phrase is equal to null, right? So it's an optional type, so it can be null. We're just going to re return was null. So if I find, um, say, nullable here, and I query it without putting anything, it was null. And if I check this box and I say test and query it, I'm going to see test. When you first start Matoko, what you're going to want to do is you want to do this, and you're going to want to just return. Once you're in here, you're just going to return phrase, right? Like, I, I, but, but I said my type was text and not null text. I could have done this. And then I could return phrase. But then this messes up and I can't return this. What I gotta do is I gotta return a nullable there. Nullable, the reason that you wanna try to avoid null is that it starts to kind of screw you up a little bit. <laughs> you gotta start handling things very gingerly because the type system is very strict. If you have a null, you gotta unwrap it. What, un what is unwrapping? Unwrapping means taking the, taking the null wrap off of the null text and it's just text. What we do here is to actually return it is we use the, the option library here to unwrap, but you see this yellow squiggle underneath it. This, this is deprecated. So this is an easy way to take this off. But what happens here is if you use this, this thing can do what's called a trap inside of it, which means your code stops running because you didn't handle the type. Now we checked that phrase wasn't equal to null, but if we were to call this, if we were to just return this and then we were to deploy and we look for say nullable, if I pass in a null here, it will fail and it will reject. Uh, and the, there's no, there's no error handling here. There's no, nothing I can do. It just unwrap just fails. Can't do that. So we have to compare it to null. And then once we're in here, we know this isn't going to trap because we already tested it, but the, the, uh, the compiler gets mad. We can't do that. We can't return a phrase. What can we do? We can do this. And it starts to get a bit messy where we switch on a phrase and we'll cover switch statements a bit more later. But uh, for now, this switch basically unwraps this. So we, we, have, to, we have to say what's going to happen if it's null. We know it's not null because we already did this. Uh, and then if we, uh, this case will unwrap it and we can finally return the unwrap. So this is, this is ugly, right? We don't, we don't want like this. We're testing for the same thing twice. That's not efficient. In my experience, you never do if X equals null because almost always, if it's not null, you want to do something with it. 
So you're almost always using some method to unwrap your nulls. So here we're using the option library to get something and this option.get lets you pass in a potentially nullable type and lets you provide a default. So this is helpful and convenient. Um, if you want to know more about the base library, there, there are some cool things you can do here, but like I said, you're gonna we're gonna we're gonna look at some other methods that that I have used a lot more. So you can go here and and explore these, and there's a few decent examples. You know, I talked about a nest, uh, getting into a nest of things that's that's sticky and and hard to get out of, and this is an example of that. Here we have a nullable object type, and it's a more complex type. So it's not just a text; it's uh, you've got a name, you've got uh, a phrase, which itself is a nullable text, and you've got an age. We're, and we, we ultimately want to return a text. So here we're going to switch on our args and we're going to see what happens if the whole thing's null. We'll say this was null. If, the, if there is a value, again, this, this question mark val will unwrap that val and inside of these quotes, you will have access to this as an unwrapped variable. So it drops the null. So this is how you easily get rid of a null. And here we have a nested item, and you'll see how, how nesting gets out of, out of whack later. Uh, we have val phrase, and if that's null, we say was null. If, if that val is, uh, if it's a nullable text, then we'll say text. Now, you'll see that this val is different than this val. Motoko uses scoped variables. So each time you redeclare an item inside of a smaller bracket, it's gonna rescope that variable. Uh, we don't like this. What what can we do? Well, say nullable quick. Um, we are going to uh, find out about do question mark blocks. We wish we could do this, right? This is kind of what you can do in JavaScript or CoffeeScript or TypeScript or, or other other base languages where you use this question mark and then you can continue. And if this is ends up being null, gives you uh, it gives you null, right? But it does not work, unfortunately. Instead, Matoko has this strange do thing, uh, do question mark. Same concept, but it's a bit more verbose. I think it's kind of ugly, and I wish we had something different. Uh, but it, it is the same concept. So we can say do question mark, and then we get this bang. The bang is like a null checker. And so it says args bang, and if it hits a bang when it's null, it returns for this whole block null. So in this case, we, we have do question, args, bang, phrase, bang. So if either one of these is bang, then it's going to do the uh, default, which is was null. If it gets past this, it should return the phrase. So in fact, if we uh, call this, say, nullable2, if we say it with a null there, we get this was null. If we put in uh, a null phrase and query, it was null. And then if we put in a phrase, so like, what do you want to do if you want to if you want to test your null equivalence? Here we're we're going to assign this. So what we're doing here is we're basically unwrapping this phrase. Keep in mind when you do this, th this doesn't remove. Uh, in our case up here, this thing came out as null, and so we got this if it was null. If it, was, if it wasn't null, then, then this get returns that. So here we're going to set phrase equal to this thing, this unwrapper, but keep in mind that it's still a question text. So we've gotten, we've gotten the phrase out of the args, but now we have a fresh quest, question text. Um, it, didn't, it doesn't unwrap it. Here we have null equivalence, and what we're going to do here is we're going to pull the phrase out of do args phrase. Now keep in mind this doesn't unwrap it. When when you do this, your phrase is going to be of a type null text. Now, what we can do here is we can say if phrase equals question yo, you put the question in front of a text and it makes it a, a nullable type, then we're going to say yo, yo, yo. And otherwise, we're going to do our what we did previously, which was do this option get. So this is, say, nullable intercepts. And here we're going to query and get was null. And then here we're going to get, here we should get null as well. And then here we're going to get, that's it. The nice thing about the do question, and this, this can be powerful, and I haven't, I haven't used this myself a whole lot, but the more that I learn about Matoko, the more I'm, I'm 
gravitating back towards this concept. Here we're going to set phrase equal to this. And so we know that when we set it equal to this do question, we are going to get a nullable phrase. But inside of this, if we set a variable equal to this thing, inside of this loop, it is unwrapped. So we, we can do equivalence here. And now what we have to do is we have to, whatever the last thing returned in a block is what that thing ends up, ends up being. So here we're gonna return either yo, yo, yo or unwrapped phrase. It's gonna put the nullable in front of it again. So we have to, we have to call this thing uh, again. So this is say nullable internal check. And here we can see that it works. It calls was null when it's null. And if we have something else, um, it works. And that, that's the basics of, of options. They're convenient when you absolutely need them. Again, try to avoid them. Now we're going to take a look at switches. So switches in Matoko are a bit different than other programming languages. Uh, if you haven't used switch statements before, it's going to take a minute. Switches use pattern matching, and it's it's very important to learn. You can't skip learning pattern matching in Matoko. It almost makes the whole thing go. And this was the hardest concept for me that I pounded my head against when I was learning Matoko. Uh, and I just tried to push it away, and I was an awful Matoko pr programmer because I didn't want to use this stuff. And I kept looking for other ways to do it. And this is it. This is the way to do it. One thing to keep in mind is that multi-dimensional switches get exponential, and that can be a problem. Uh, and they are still kind of annoying. Um, I'm, I wish there were other ways to do some of this stuff. I wish it was easier to unwrap a variable or unwrap a variant. But the method that we've been giving, given is the switch statement. First of all, switch statements are not the same as select statements. That may be obvious to you. But it wasn't to me. And I really, really wanted these things to be select statements. You can't do switch phrase and case phrase equals yo, do yo, 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 or else just output the phrase. If you want to do something like this, you need to use if else. And it's you get messy if else chains, but that's that's what Motoko does. So if phrase equals yo, else if phrase equals other else phrase. So here we have say case. And um, if we put in yo, it should output yo, yo, yo. And if we put other, it should say some other. Uh, if we put test, we're going to see test. So really, really go and learn about pattern matching. Um, it's going to be super important here. I'll pull, pull this side up really quickly. This page will sort of help you better understand pattern matching. And uh, it's really pretty powerful. So how does pattern matching work? We already saw this null switch uh, in, in our other example, but I'm going to use it here. When you switch on a phrase, pattern matching kicks in, and it is going to try to match whatever's in here to whatever's in your case statements. So because this is a nullable text, my patterns that are available to me are basically null or not null. So if it's null, we do this. If it's not null, we pattern match, and then this unwrapped val gets passed to the next context. So this, this really has a, has a bracket around it. And that unwrapped variable is taken out of one pattern and exposed to the next pattern as, as a variable. The other place you're going to use it a ton is with variants. So in this save variant function, I've declared that my phrase is either a variant called nully or a phrase of type text. So you can't skip variants either. They're super powerful. Just lean in and learn them, and you'll get to be a, an amazing Matoko developer much faster. Uh, variants don't have to have a type. They can just be sort of a, a declaration, almost like an enum. Um, but they're, they're cool because they're like an enum that can also have a type. Uh, and, and your different enums can have different types. So if you have a bunch of different data, you can you can arrange a set of possible values that all have different types. Uh, be like you know if if I asked what was in the garage, and there could either be a bicycle or a car. Well, a bicycle is going to have much different data than a car is. 
So this allows us to control that. The switch statement allows us to unwrap our variance. We do case nully, and we can say it's null. And if it's a phrase, we're, we can unwrap the variable again by, by putting the value here, and then that value gets cast down into our next block, unwrapped without the variant. So, you know, I'm not, I don't have to return, uh, I'm returning a text here. I'm not returning a pound phrase text. So this gets me, this gets me the, uh, the variable unwrapped. Now, cases have a catch-all. What if you had a giant enum? What if you had a variant that had thousands of items and you only wanted the, you only were really concerned with one of them? Well, this, this would help you. This underscore is like your else. So here I'm looking for, so I, I know that I only have two variants here, so I'm gonna check for the first one. And instead of writing this pound nulli code, I can say for anything else, it was null because there's only two. Pattern matching matches on each thing that you pass into the switch statement, and you can pass basically parameters into your switch. Your next statement uh, is going to match going from, from top to bottom, each thing that you put in there, and the first one that it finds that matches, it will, it will match against. So um, here we are going to look at phrase and mood. So my type has both a phrase and then also a mood, which is either chill or hardcore. If I have a phrase and I'm chill, I'm gonna add man onto the end. And if it's hardcore, I'm gonna add some exclamation points. If I look at say multi, and I'm gonna say a phrase like chill, and I'm gonna pick chill as my mode, I'm gonna say chill man. And if I pick hardcore, I'm gonna say chill. And Uh, Austin, you're still on mute. You have to first unmute yourself. Okay. All right. Elder. Sorry. Um, so somebody asked a really good question about um, these these hash marks in front of a name. Um, if you're not familiar with those, those are variants, and they're a lot like an enumerator. So in other languages, you have an enum, and and typically you put the items in. You know. You know. You know, pounds or, or Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or, or whatever, and they get assigned like zero to seven or zero to six, and you can use them that way. So they're they're used kind of like that, but they're strongly typed, and each one can have its own type. So you can have, um, you know, Sunday you can assign a text to it, Monday you can assign a number to it, Thursday you can assign a nullable text to it. Um, so vari variants are very important. If you haven't covered those um, yet, uh, you will. And um, the, the way you access and handle the different variants in your uh, in your code when you have those kinds of types or when you get them back from another canister uh, is to use these switch statements. So I hope that answers that question. Um, and you'll see some more examples here. And, and if it's still an issue afterwards, we can do some live coding and I'll walk you through it. Okay, back to the back to the show. And if I select nully, uh, hardcore, it just says was null. And if I select nully, chill, it just says was null. I don't I react to that. So we see here phrase unwrap, and then we have a second one, chill. So if the if it's a phrase with the text inside of it in chill, it's going to do this. If it's a phrase and a hardcore, it's going to do this. Anything else, it's going to say was null. If I do something like this. The compiler's gonna get mad at me and it's gonna tell me this pattern is never matched. So if you put your else statement above everything else, this will be the first thing that's that's matched. The issue with switches is they get exponential. So here we're going, we've got a phrase that's either nulli or phrase, we've got a mood which is chill or hardcore, and we have a color red, blue, or green. And we're gonna return back some kind of text. So here we're gonna we're gonna switch on three different things: phrase, mood, and color. And you see that. With three, I have to numerate out. Now here I've got nine items that I have uh, enumerated out, and I'm not even paying attention to the middle one. So if I was paying attention to the middle one, I'd have to have to do another another six, I believe. So there ended up being twelve of these things. So you're if you want to match every case, it starts to starts to explode and it starts to become very exponential. And 
the compiler doesn't like it when you skip things. So if I if I, if I comment this one out, it's gonna it's gonna look at all my possible values and it's gonna tell me that it does the switch of this type does not cover this value. It's missing something. There's something that I haven't handled. That can cause a trap later on if if you actually try to set the result of this switch equal to a variable and it can't find anything that matches, you're gonna get a trap. Uh, and that's gonna be bad for your program. Here we, you know, we we do this case and we say font red and unwrapped value, and then we add our man, right? Well, this is this is a lot of repeated code, we can refactor this a bit. Instead of doing it like this, we are going to do a nested switch. But you can see where if you had lots of a very complicated program, this nest of switches could begin to get very, very complicated and hard to follow and hard to read. Uh, this was my biggest weakness when I when I started out as, as a Matoko programmer. I ended up with these massive nests, and I would encourage you to get past that very quickly. Here we're going to, instead of switching on three things and getting like this long list, we're gonna switch on each one individually. But here when I switch on phrase, I say, okay, if it's, if it's a phrase, I'm gonna do this. And if it's null, I'm gonna do this. Well, th then I gotta take my unwrapped value. I'm gonna switch on mood and hardcore chill. And then I gotta switch on my color. So I ended up, I, I still end up with a lot of repeated code, right? I've got uh, deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. This is not ideal either, but we can see that it does work. We can say, hey, nully, hardcore, blue, and query that. It should just be like was null, but blue was null. We can say phrase, hello, hardcore, red, and we should say, we should see uh, red, hello, hello. <laughs> um, <laughs> what you want to do with switch statements is you want to work linearly. It makes your code much easier to read. Uh, much easier to edit, and you'll be able to maintain it much, much more easily. So here we've got the same same setup, but we're going to look at each one individually. So the first thing we're going to do is we get our modifier out of either chill or hardcore. Then we're going to get our phrase where it either was null or we're going to put, or we're going to pair our phrase with our modifier. And then we're going to do the color, and this we actually just return here uh, whatever the result of this is. So we put the we put the phrase inside of this app. So this is really how you want to handle this instead of doing a bunch of switches. You'll quickly find, especially if you're trying to do something productive, that one, one place where you use this is with checking things and making sure that uh, you know a record exists or that a user has access rights or that uh, w w whatever it is, if the user does something wrong, you want to return an error and you don't want to let them call the function. If they don't have enough tokens in their account, you don't want to send tokens. What's nice about switches is that if you return from a switch, it's of type any and your compiler will complain and your program will work. So I've taken our linear one here and I've basically created a function called not green or hardcore. We don't allow hardcore and we don't allow green. So if we get something passed in here, we can return here and it doesn't set modifier equal to this, it just returns. This would be the last line run if it was too hardcore. And with the color, same here, we can return, and inside of our return, we can return an error. Now to do this, we have we use this result. A result type looks like okay, and then a type, or error, and then a type. And this is how you how you declare it, result, the result, dot result, and you can put, say you were trying to look up a user, could uh, return the user here, and then some kind of error object here. And that's gonna let you, let you declare it. Uh, and now you can either return okay and your user, or an error and your error object. That is what result does. So this, so here I'm returning a variant of two hardcore. And this does in fact work. Um, if we come up here and select nully, hardcore, and blue, and query it, we're going to get two hardcore. If we select chill, it's going to say was null with a blue. And if we put a phrase in, we should get a blue phrase uh, as chill, so test man. That switches. That's the basics of it. And they're, they're super important. Um, and I, I practice with them and use them liberally in your code base. Next, we're going to talk about lists. Um, this is an interesting topic because 
when Motoko first shipped, it kind of came with this base library. And I'll just say a lot of stuff was missing. Over time, new types have popped up and we found issues with old types and things like that. There's like a specific thing called an associated list, but there's also like all kinds of other objects. Let's go through them real fast, right? There's an array, which is a native object. It's a list of things. And you can either have a hard-coded or, or like, like a frozen array that can't be changed, or you can have a variable array where you can change the items inside the list. But either way, they're, the, the, the size is limited. We still use arrays a lot because they're vital for transfer between canisters because arrays are stable structures, and only stable structures can be uh, sent from one canister to another. We also have an associated list. I have never used it. We have a buffer. And if you want an array, you want to use a buffer. If you're going to work, be working with an array, use a buffer. Uh, there's a DQ list. And this is an interesting thing, uh, an interesting list because you can pull and pop things off the front and back. And it's a functional structure. So if you go like push stuff on and then pull stuff off the front or, you know, pull stuff off the front and potentially put it back on the front. Uh, if, if, if there's an error, a DQ is an interesting structure. Um, you'll find all of these over here in the, uh, on the reference page of the Internet Computer Guide. Y you, can, you can find these things like DQ, and it'll tell you, um, you know, push front, peak front, pop front, push back, peak back. These are all things that you're just going to have to use. Um, I could go through a bunch of code for each one, but it's really best to just try to use them and um, see what see what they do. A hash map, you'll see a lot of that in sample code. It does have a very pervasive performance flaw, and so it's fallen a bit out of use. Iter is a whole class that abstracts an array into like a functional list. You you access an object, and there's a next function that goes to the next that goes to the next item in the list. So these are important for, for looping. A lot of times you use an iter even when you don't know you're using an iter if you're using a for loop over a list. There is a stack which provides very simple, you know, last in, first out uh, type processing. There's a tree. I don't think I've ever used a tree. Uh, there's a tree map which sort of took over for hash map but the tree map also has an issue with it where if your keys are not sufficiently random, you can end up with a very unbalanced map and it can hit, have performance issues uh, very quickly. Uh, there's also a tree set, which I haven't used. I think it's the same as a tree map, except it just keeps unique keys instead of having a key value pair. Now, what I will mention is that there is this other library called the Toko hash map. From what I've seen and what I've experienced, it is the most efficient hash map out there at the moment. Um, and I would suggest that you use that. It was actually developed by one of our developers, uh, Evgeny at, uh, at Origin, and it provides like four to 11 X performance improvement over a standard hash map. Uh, so you can put a lot more objects into it. You can access things a lot faster. It uses some of the indexing uh, strategies from the V8 browser uh, to put, put a, put a hash map together. It also includes sets, which like I mentioned tree set, it's, it's, you know, if you need to maintain a unique set of just keys, it can do that. It also is cool because it maintains insertion order. You can treat it like a DQ or a list and it's stable. It's a functional stable library. So you don't have to worry about upgrades for it unless you actually change the structure of the type of hash map that it is with hash maps and tree sets and tree maps, you have to, anytime you upgrade your canister, you have to dump all of your data to an array. When you fire back up, you have to pull it all back out and put it into your object, uh, which can cause cycle limit errors. And it's just a lot of processing every time you want to upgrade your canister. With a with, with this Motoko hash map, you, you don't have to do that. It's a stable structure and um, you don't, you don't have to do anything in pre or post upgrade with it. Let's go look, look at these, uh, buffer. It, like I said, it's, it's, it's basically your standard array object. Now buffers, you do need to handle in two upgrade, I mean, uh, pre and post upgrade. Uh, and so you may even want to use a stable map. There, there's a couple other libraries out there like stable buffer. Uh, it, it, if you're going to be not just calculating with it, but storing state in it, uh, you may want to look at the stable buffer library that I think was 
built by CanScale. So here we're going to create a type called student, first name, last name, gender, age. And we're going to create a buffer of students. Um, you can initialize the array, that, like, the, like the reserved memory space of an array using this. Here I, I'm just using one. And then we're going to add some items. We're going to add John Doe, uh, 16. He's a male. We've got Jane Doe, female. We've got Ryan Smith, uh, gender of other, uh, Ananya maintaining privacy here. And then we've got this weird not a record that we added. Uh, and so that was an error. And so we're going to remove uh, that index from the class. We wish we could return buffers in our in our actor functions. Like it would be great to just, we want to be able to do this. Um, hey, I'm storing this buffer in my actor. I, let me just let me just return that buffer. But buffers are not a stable type. You have to get the array out. So buffers have this function, buffer to array, and you'll call that a lot if you work with buffers. Uh, and you end up sending that data back and forth. It just dumps the buffer to an array. You can get the size. We can count the number of people in our class, three, because we added four and then removed one. We do our average age. Here we're going to loop over. This is our iteration. And there's this dot vowels. So you take a buffer and you say dot vowels, it creates that iter object I was talking about. And you can use that in a for statement to loop over the items. So here we're looping through each one, adding it to an age, and then we're returning, returning it by the size that we calculated earlier. And here, if we take the average age, it turns out it's 16, which makes sense. I think we've got two 16-year-olds and a 17-year-old, and it's a nat, well, so it's 16. Now, we wish we could do something like this, because that's our standard array notation, right? A class zero. We can't do that with a buffer. We have to call get. You know, be careful because this this traps. There is a get opt that will return you an optional value. If you were to get five and it couldn't find, there, there's not five students, it would return you a null. But this will get you the this will get you the first item provided it's there. Also replace an item by putting it at a particular index. So here, whatever index you, you know, whatever student you pass in gets replaced and then we return the array. You have to be careful with this put because it traps. If you were to do this, we only have three students, this is gonna trap and it's gonna cause you problems. So let's test that out. Uh, let's find replace. Age four, female, test, test. And we're going to query that and we should get back that second item, test, test, is now uh, now here. If we do this, we deploy, here we're gonna get a trap. So this, this trap, so make sure you check the length of your array before doing your put, or the length of your buffer. So there's lots of other buffer functions. I am not going to go through them all. They're on the buffer list here. You can do all kinds of things in here, right? You can do, uh, you can remove the last, you can remove an item, you can clear the array, you can filter the entities by a particular thing. You can see if it's empty. You can find the min or the max of something. You can compare buffers. You can, the, the new buffer, the new buffer library is really, um, really powerful. There's merging and splitting and all kinds of things that we didn't have before. Um, and that were, were very expensive to do with standard arrays. The buffer class has made them uh, much easier to do. The last thing we're going to look at is this, this hash map. And we're just going to look at it from a very high level. Uh, you're just going to have to use this object. It's a very, very useful object. Do this and they will, now by declaring these as stable vars, I won't have to upgrade these. They'll just, they'll stay active. Maybe, maybe we'll try, a, try that in a second. You can declare new ones of different types. And then what you pass in is you pass in this hash. It's really, I think there's, I think it's a combination of three functions, which is a, a compare function, which tells you if your keys are equal. Uh, it is a order function that tells you if things are greater than or less than. And then there is a get function that returns the item back or edits it and returns the item back. So you'll have to look in, look into the library. If you want to create a uh, stable var, your own type up here, then you're going to have to look at the library and, and get a bit more creative and write your own functions for uh, order uh, 
and compare. So here we're, we're just, you know, you've got, you've got a set where you can set the, the key and value on these things. You just have to pass in the map, the hash function that you want to use. In this case, we use the in hash because the key is a NAT, I hash for integers, T hash for text, P hash for principles. So that, that's how you would set values, put values, uh, which is a bit different than set um, in that this returns the latest value, I believe. So it um, ignores here because we, we don't want to do anything with it, but um, we're, we're putting all of these values. And then if we wanted to have access to that value and manipulate it, we could do that here. Uh, we can check if, if a map has a value, has a, has a key. Uh, we can get an item by its key. We can check the size of an item. We can delete an item, uh, remove an item. We can loop over them. We, we, we can loop over the keys. We can loop over the values and we can loop over the entries. We can filter out a map. Um, we can map across a map, which will apply a function to every item in the map. Find, we can uh, find from the back and we can clear it out. Uh, here we're going to quickly, we're going to just return all the keys and this is entries. Uh, you'll notice that entries is an iter of a tuple of a zero and one. So if this map in, in our case is a text, uh, NAT, so entries is going to give you each entry inside for this item. It's going to be index zero is your text and index one is your NAT. We will deploy and we can call all keys and we'll see that it adds a a d it returns a a d d because we um uh, we added a b c and d but then we later deleted and removed uh b b b and c c c and you can sum the values so if you look at or the total across those two it's 12. Uh, and then you can back up your items. So if you want to output all of your entries, and this is what you would use if you needed to, if you needed to dump something to a backup function or put something, if you didn't want to use pre and post upgrade, you can do this iter to array uh, and then pass in the entries. And that is going to just dump out all your records. Now, very quickly, since we added those stable vars, let's add a, um, a shared function add and then we'll do x is text and y is a nat and it's going to return nothing map dot put in map three in our text hash you're going to put x and y in our map i guess we use set if we just if we don't care about the return so let's let's deploy this and we're going to upgrade so now i'm going to add d d d d no i'm going to add something else i'm going to add test and 56 all that give it a minute to process now when i query all keys i'll see that test has been added to the end now what's interesting here you'll notice is that it maintains insertion order which can be interesting. So if you want to use this as a list, an ordered list in time of when things came in, you, you can. And I'm going to some values, you'll see my value is much higher. Let's add something here. Let's just do a git and uh, async is nat and we're just going to pass in x. We're going to use our switch statements here because get, we're going to look in map three using our text hash for X and it's going to say, Hey, you can't do that. And it's because it can instantiate the function. Why can't it do that? Well, we're going to, it, it's, it actually returns an optional text. So we're going to need to switch case null and case question item. I'm going to upgrade this. And you'll see that um, it should not lose the updates that we made because we declared this map three statement. See what happens. Let's query our keys, and we'll see that they're all still there. So now if I get test, it should return 56. And if I get something not in the list, I'm going to get 
zero. If I wanted to return to this, I do that, I got to put a nullable in front of here. I do that and deploy. Upgrading again. It's going to warn me. I've changed the function signature. If this tells me that I've changed a fundamental type, I could erase all my data, so be very careful. Just changing a function signature is not going to bite you in the rear end unless you have a running service that other people are using. But definitely be careful changing your data structures. If that happens, you'll lose all your data and, and be very sad. So now when I get, if I get something that I don't have, it's going to return back to me a optional null. And if I return this, this it should return back to me an opt 56. Opt is the same as question mark. So that's, that's uh, lists and switches and optionals. Thanks everybody for watching and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Please feel free to reach out. Uh, I love helping developers learn Matoko and build for the internet computer, and I'd love to get to know you. Um, I hope that you will participate in the Origin Hackathon that we are launching uh, at the end of this bootcamp. Thank you for joining. Awesome. Thank you, Austin. Take myself off mute. Okay. Anyone that has questions, feel free to either put them into the Q&A box or raise your hand and then we can also bring you on here if you want to discuss something with Austin. I see we have one hand raised. I'll uh, bring Dan on. Let me see if this works. Yep. Dan, you should now be able to unmute you and ask your question. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you, Austin. This is an awesome display of uh, of knowledge it's gonna um can be very valuable when we all are getting into the weeds <laughs> i'm happy to have it as a video because boy you're gonna have to slow down a bit for me to really get it but i wanted to just ask a question about this nature of um moving data between canisters you mentioned i think that the buffer um was a as a great vehicle for for doing that transfers but um, if, if, say, for example, you build uh, lists inside, you, you're kind of saying build these lists inside of buffers, and then you have to take them out of the buffer when you work, work with them again. Is that roughly how to think about it? Well, it's really uh, um, generally you'll you'll keep things in a buffer, especially if you're keeping state uh, in your buffer. You'll 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 keep it in there, and because buffers are easier to work with, and since these canisters have what's called quote unquote, orthogonal memory, you don't have to recreate that buffer every time. Where you get into, uh, uh, where it becomes an issue is when you want to return data to someone. Basically, uh, stable types mean that there's no functions. You can't, uh, when, you, when you return, if you query your users, uh, you, you have a users endpoint and you wanna return a list of users, but you have a function in your user object called full name that adds first name plus last name, it won't let you do that. You have to dump that user list to a list of stable, stable items, which means all native variables. So ints, nats, texts, um, things like that. You can't return code, unfortunately. That would actually be really cool if you could, but, but you can't at, at the moment. So you'll you'll usually keep things in buffer as you're using them, uh, you know, as sort of in your core business logic of, of your canister. But then at the end of your functions, when you're sending data back to the user, you'll take whatever buffer you end up with. It, say you were you were accumulating a buffer by checking for people who have an odd age, right? And so you loop over all your users, you look at the age, and every time it's odd, you add it to a buffer. At the end, you basically dump that to array. And uh, and you may have to dump it to an array with a map that calls something called users to stable, that will take uh, that will take each of your fancy user objects and pull out only the hardcore um, hardcore items that are not um, uh, you know, that aren't functions. And that that's a pretty deep concept um, under the covers, but you run into it very early. And it's frustrating because you're like, I just want to return this 
damn user. Why can't I return the user? And that that's the reason. And so I really try to, when I program, I try to keep everything, I try to keep things as stable as possible. And you, you can see with that map that I showed you that it's a functional map. The, the items that it, it um, the objects don't have functions hanging off of them. You have a class that you hand an object to inside of the function and it operates on top of the stable type. So you're gonna have better, better luck uh, managing your state and returning things if you kind of bend your object oriented thinking to more of a functional type uh, uh, programming model uh, on top of your data. Does okay. that does that answer the question? Well, yes, uh, basically. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there, but I, I I certainly will find great value in this video. So thanks a lot. I, I think thank you for enduring my speed. I, I, I hope you guys are going to share that and people can watch it on on a slower speed. I had to. It was like an hour and a half, and I had to edit out all my ums and uhs and. Thanks. Oh yeah, Thanks. that is that's absolutely necessary. I would encourage uh, saving that for us all. Yeah. Yeah. So, so uh, definitely going to be available uh, for download as well. Uh, probably a couple hours after uh, we finish here, and then everyone's free to play that whatever speed they feel most. Uh, yeah. What's best for them? I see. A, I see a couple more questions. A, a buffer is like an array list. Yes, buffer is mostly like an array list. Um, is the order of keys in a map uh, the 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 Matoko hash map that Yevgeny did is it purposely maintains insertion order, um, and so that's a you could think of it as a feature or a or a bonus. Um, you could treat it like an ordered list um, because it maintains that insertion order. Uh, and in fact, I, I think there's peak po a peak pop and and functions like that on it. So um, if you want to, you can treat it you can treat it like a list. Um, and just quickly, because uh, I'm not sure if in the recording these questions will show up. So this was the answer to the question: Is the order of keys in the map a specified feature or a side effect of the implementation? Yeah, the ordering of keys. Uh, I don't I don't know about other hash maps and things like that, but I know that that in in that in Yevgeny's it is stable and will stay uh, stay the keys will be in insertion order. Um, now I don't think if you update if you update your value it doesn't back it to the end. You're going to have to you're going to have to remove it and, and put it at the end if you want to if you want to pop it to the end. Uh, what is the best way to order a list of students by the age or by the name? I believe that, like, I believe if you have a buffer, I think there is an order. Um, uh, there is, I should share my screen so you guys can see what I'm looking at. Um, there is a sort. Um, and so for sort, what you do is you pass in a function that takes X, uh, that takes an X or takes two, two items of the same type, and then it returns this order. And order is another type, which I think it's, it's, it's what you typically think of. I think negative one is less, zero is equal, and one is, um, uh, now that I say that, that may not be true. It's down here. Order is, uh, oh, okay. It actually returns less, equal, or greater. So you can just write that function and um, it'll iterate over all of your items and it'll sort them for you and it will output a, uh, it'll output, it actually reorders your buffer, it looks like. Yeah, so this is a good, this is a good example. And there, there are some natural compare, or there, there are some compare, functions included in most of the base libraries. Okay, there is a DS from the encrypted notes. Why is there zero text equal text hash added to the initialization? And what do they mean?
Uh, those, so, so when you use a functional, just like here where you, you had to pass in a NAT compare into this function, when you use some of the more functional types like hash map, uh, um, you have to provide it with the functions that you want it to use to do certain things. So a lot of what a hash map does is compare things and hash things. So it hashes your key and uses that. Uh, that makes, uh, if, if, if you publish a novel as your key, it's going to hash it down into a 32-bit number. And you can put all the text of your novels in, and they'll all get 32-bit numbers. So that makes them much more manageable and unique uh, uh, with less processing power. So when it's comparing them, it can compare the hash the hashes to see if the keys are equal, and then the uh, the equal will will be used when it's comparing the values uh, in, in your map. So um, it, you literally, a lot of times, it's just you know the, the, the comparer for NAT is does X equal Y, right? Yes or no, true or false. I hope that answers that question. Um, Buffers versus maps. Can you have a buffer of blobs? You can definitely have a buffer of blobs. Um, in fact, in the origin NFT, we keep uh, the files in a buffer of blobs. Um, it's actually a workspace object that's a buffer of a buffer of a buffer of blobs. So you can get to them quickly and manage them easily. Um, uh, Pros and cons of buffers and maps. Uh, the, the, the standard buffer is not functional. And so you have to, you have to use pre and post upgrade. Um, Byron at CanScale has a stable buffer that I use in a number of places, but it doesn't have a lot of the cool new functions. So uh, if somebody wants a task, they can go fork Byron's uh, uh, stable buffer and go add all of the uh, the new cool buffer functions that we just got in one of the latest Matoka releases to stable buffer. Um, I, I typically operate just after having written a number of canisters, I, I typically try to use stable structures like that, like that Matoko hash map or stable buffer. Um, buffers are better when you just need a list of things, right? And it doesn't, you don't have to get to them fast and you're perfectly fine iterating over the list if you need to do analysis or uh, you're keeping an, in, uh, an index somewhere else so that you can easily access the buffer, the index and the buffer. Um, hash maps are great when you know you're going to have a lot of data and you don't want, um, what hash maps do is when you have a million items, you don't have to start at zero and look for your key going to the end. That would take a thousand lookups. Instead, they put it in like a tree structure where they're able to go down the tree greater than or less than depending on what the hash is and so it gets to a value uh through far fewer steps than it would if it had to search through the entire the entire thing um so if you have a key value that it, it, it makes sense um sets are also cool i haven't used sets a whole lot but uh, sets are nice because they maintain uniqueness uh based off of uh, off of their value. So if you only, if you know, you only want to have one entry in your thing, uh, of each unique entry, um, you could use a set, whereas a buffer would let you add the same, same thing in. So if you had a set of numbers, uh, you can only add one five to the set, uh, uh, and a buffer, you could add five. You could just keep adding five and your buffer would just keep getting bigger and bigger. You'd have in number of files. Great, thanks. And it seems like that was the last question that we had here. Also, just five minutes over. Great that we, oh. Hackathon, okay, yeah. So uh, the Medium post will hopefully be going up uh, later today. Uh, we're gonna wait for you guys to finish up this amazing boot camp that Code and State is putting on. Um, once it's done, uh, we will be kicking off uh, an origin hackathon that'll last a month. We'll have workshops and things like that, uh, and there's prizes. All of that will be in the forthcoming media post, medium post. Um, but we've got a lot of a lot of OGY that we have available 
and that we want to uh, reward you guys with whoever whoever can find the best use case of the origin nft so more to come good stuff thanks so much austin great to have you here thanks for uh, this download of uh, knowledge have a good day and uh, we'll talk soon thanks everybody